We gather this fine day in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Good morning, church. Good to be in the house of the Lord with each and every one of you. A special greeting to any and all guests who are among us. We certainly appreciate your presence. And if you would kindly give us your, your contact information, we'd love to send you some info about the church electronically. But we promise not to come knocking on your door. But guest, uh, welcome to you. As a matter of fact, just, just, well, let's just take like 30 seconds here and greet somebody that you don't know that's around you. Just, just say welcome. Welcome in the name of Jesus. Let's do it. You know everybody? I'll find somebody you don't know. Not everybody knows you. I'll find somebody. Yeah, Chris Nevins, hi. Almost, almost last night. Close game, close game. No, it was. Yeah. Welcome to you. Hey, welcome online as well. Everybody online, we welcome you in the name of Jesus as well. Hey, the Lord be with you. Thank you. That's enough of that. That's enough of that already. Save some of that energy for worship. We do greet all those who are joining us online this morning as well. Uh, thank you for your presence uh, with us in worship as well. Hey, raise your hand, maybe both hands if you got rain this last week. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise be to God. And goodness, we got a cold front here today. We got another one coming in, I think, tonight or tomorrow. Uh, as the Germans around here say, frisch, frisch weather. So that uh, just means that it's kind of cool, but it is that time of year. We have child care, adult supervised child care on the lower level. You can access the lower level by the stairwells that are up here in the front if you have that particular need. Hey, talking about need, we have a need in our, our church community uh, for a family who's experiencing a, a loss and a grief, family of uh, Kermit Otmers. Kermit passed away this last week. Funeral services are yet pending. It'll either be Friday or Saturday of this next week. Call the church office or check shutters online, and you can uh, figure out when that will be. Hey, we're uh, remembering and giving thanks to God this month, right? Thanking God for the rain. We also would be remiss if we didn't thank our veterans who have served. So if we have any veterans who have served in any capacity, uh, please stand up so that we can recognize you. Please, veterans, rise up. And stay standing, stay standing, because you know what? When, when you serve, you don't serve alone, but your family is serving and going through things as well. So family members uh, rise up as well. Children, spouses, grandchildren, uh, that type of thing as well. Yes, indeed. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, thank you for your service. You can be seated, but we won't have a prayer. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of freedom which is not so free. So Lord, it, it uh, costs lives and, and blood and sacrifice. And we thank you, Lord, for those who are willing to uh, protect the freedoms which uh, we so many times take for granted. So Lord, just uh, uh, sharpen our pencils with respect to uh, appreciating what we have and uh, giving thanks, O oh Lord, to those who have served and help us, Lord, to be good and faithful citizens Lord, uh, ultimately, we're thankful for, for Jesus, who is, the, the, again, the ultimate freedom fighter for forgiveness of our sins, for new life now and eternal life to come. So, Lord, uh, we're thankful. We're thankful in this month of Thanksgiving for so much, including this. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, it's time for us to get into worship. Our women of faith are leading us uh, in the worship service. Uh, Pastor Steve is, is preaching this morning, and uh, his message is going to focus upon our theme, which is us not underestimating God. And the story today is about Elijah and about how Elijah thought he was the only one left. And yet uh, God reminds him, as God reminds us, that he will never leave us or forsake us and that we are not never alone. So may God bless us with that great reminder in our hearts and in our lives now and always. Amen. 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 First thing we do as we come together is admit that we're a broken people in need of a Savior, and He provides in Christ on the cross and in the resurrection through the forgiveness of sins. So please rise as you are able for the confession and forgiveness. 
In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Beloved of God, I invite you to confess your sins to the Lord in silence. Let us confess our sins before Almighty God, most merciful God. We confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done and by what we have left undone, we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a fellow member of the body of Christ, I declare to you that your sins are forgiven in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And now we join together in our opening song. The grace of God, the compassion of Christ, and the hope of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Lord God, in our humanity, we often underestimate you. With our limited minds, we cannot comprehend the entirety of your good and precious will. Almighty One, lead us to acclaim your omnipotence. Sovereign One, 
Remind us that you are omniscient. Everlasting Father, help us to trust that you are omnipresent. Most High and Holy One, give us faith to not underestimate you. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, pour out your Holy Spirit on us and keep us steadfast in your word. Help us experience the power of your grace and love in our lives in the midst of the challenges and temptations of each day. We ask these things through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and your Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. It's time for some special music by a special ensemble that the women have put together here today. So congregation, please be seated as our hearts are ministered to by this special group.
Thank you, girls. Goodness gracious. Uh, you know, thank you, Katie Hoffman, for putting this group together. And, uh, you know, today, again, women are leading our worship uh, service. Uh, Pastor Steve, of course, still preaching. Uh, all the, the females, all the women are part of women of the church, but there's a special organization that kind of helps lift up and drive us in certain areas of mission. And that area of mission that they're uplifting today is, is uh, Meals on Wheels. And so there will be a special uh, offering today that we have opportunity to give towards that. But thank you again, a Women of Faith, and for this special group of singers as well. It's time for the children's message. So kiddos, come on up. We have Miss Sue bringing the word today. Come on down. Good morning, y'all. How are you? I'm glad you made it. Down in the cold. Thank you. It's always good to have a helper. How are y'all? Was that a little cool today? Yeah. Well, I'm going to try this one more time today. Last year when I got down on my knees to sit down with y'all, my friend that was sitting over there said, oh, I didn't think you'd get back up. <laughs> In the first service, we were talking about helpers, people who have jobs. You know, the sermon today is about Elijah. He was a prophet. He had a really big job telling people about God. And we all have jobs, don't we? Elijah thought he was all alone until God said, oh, no. I've got thousands more. And God has helpers all around the world, and he has helpers in this church. Who do you think has a big job in this church? Who does a big job, Henry? Wake up, Henry. <laughs> Daniel. Daniel has a big job. I heard that in the first service, too. And you know what? If I can't get back up off my knees, Daniel's got a really big job this morning. Because he's got to get up here and get me up. Who else? Pastor Bobby has a big job. He does. Pastor Steve, our occasional Pastor David. We have lots, Pastor Clint. They all have big jobs, don't they? Because they are telling people about God. But do you have a job too? Do you think you could have a job in this church? We all have jobs, don't we? What do you think is a little job? What would be a little job, do you think? Yes. I can't see you, but what? Is, you think that's a little job to do? We all do, don't we? We get asked to do jobs. Well, when you came in the door this morning, was there someone there to greet you and smile at you and give you a bulletin? Yeah, do you think that's a little job? It is. It's a little job. And it's one that I get to do a couple of times a year. I love doing it. You get to be the first one to see them come in the door. You get to greet them, say hello. I'm glad you're here. And you know that for some people who live alone, you may be the first one that day who's gotten to greet them. And that's a big thing to them. And it's an important thing. Don't you like for people to say hello to you and smile at you? That's important, isn't it? And you know, in our town, there are people who live alone and for many different reasons can't fix their meals anymore. And so we have a group of people who take meals to them in their homes and they get to see them once a day, Monday through Friday, somebody goes. And it seems like a little thing, doesn't it? Because can most of you fix you something to eat if, you, if you're hungry? Could you fix you something to eat? But there's some who can't. And so when they go and take them that meal, they may be the only person they see all day. And that's an important thing. And if they need more help, they get help for them. But we all have jobs to do, don't we? There are things that you can do. I'm going to ask you to do something today. And maybe you think it's a small job. How many of you can color pictures and draw pictures? Can you do that? Well, today I have these packets for you, and there's a couple of cards in here, and one of them is a picture of a little caterpillar, and it just says, just wanted to say hi, and poor little caterpillar, has a, he has a cast on one foot, so he needed some tender loving care too, didn't he? He needs somebody to care for him, and so I would like for you to color that, and there's another card in here, 
and it's a picture of a little girl, and it says, God and I thought of you today. And on the back, there's nothing there, so maybe you could draw a picture on the back of it and color it. Could you do that? There's a small box of crayons in here for you. Be careful, because Pastor Bobby broke one of his during the first service. So... I would like for you to do these because I want to come tomorrow and collect these, pick these up, and take them to the place that delivers the meals. So when they get a meal, they can get a picture that you drew or that you colored, something to make them realize somebody thought about me and somebody cares about me and somebody made a pretty picture for me. And maybe that will make them feel better Give them a smile and cheer them up. Do you think you could do that? Okay, so before you go back, I'm going to ask you to take one of these with you, or you can take two, and don't tell Pastor Steve, but while he's preaching, you can be coloring, okay? And then as you leave, there is a basket on the table by the door, and if you just put your cards in there so I can collect them, and we'll give them to somebody that will need a little cheering up. We can do that together, right? Okay, then let's pray. Our hands we fold, our heads we bow. It's time to talk to God right now. Dear God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for helping us share your love. We pray that these cards will brighten someone's day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. Henry, help me. Here's an extra one, Sue. I'll give mine back. No, I'll color one if one's left over. Congregation, we have a song to sing as we anticipate God's word for us today. So in respect of that word, uh, let's rise. Let's rise as we hear the word of God. Singing this song in preparation. Our sermon series, Underestimating God, continues with the prophet Elijah's cry to the Lord. I'm the only one left. The prophet Elijah was running for his life and complains to the Lord God that there is no one left on earth who is faithful to the Lord. But God reminds him that there are indeed 7,000 others who have not bowed down to the knee to other gods. Our reading is from 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 9 through 18. And the word of the Lord came to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? 
He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I'm the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said to him, Go back the way you came, and go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazel, king over Aram. Also anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, king over Israel. And anoint Elijah, son of Shaphat, from Abel Mahola, to succeed you as prophet. Yehu will put to death any who escaped the word of Hazel, and Elijah will put to death any who escaped the sword of Yehu. Yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal, whose mouths have not kissed him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Um, and typically I, I don't do this, but... Um, th- th- when I was choosing these texts, and I thought, oh boy, there's some, a lot of names in there. And uh, so we just need to say thank you to this young woman here for doing such a wonderful job. I will tell you that there are many times I have adults say, Pastor, how do we say this? Or, I can't, I can't. <laughs> so well done, well done. You got them just right, too. So I'm going to invite you to pray with me, please. Lord God, we are so grateful that uh, you provide for us the gift and power of the Holy Spirit. Pour your Spirit into each one of us this day that we may um, enjoy and also be convicted by, but also encouraged by your word. In the precious name of Jesus, amen. So underestimating God, Elijah saying, I'm the only one left. Uh, Let's take a look at... Oh, what artist, one artist depiction of what Elijah or really any of the prophets might have been looking like. You know, they had the fire in their eyes, the wind in their beards, and their typical phrase was, thus says the Lord. So when somebody in your life goes like this to you, what did that usually mean? You're in trouble. You, <laughs> you got that right. Um, and it depended on the person, Right. Uh, the, and it was, it may not have been thus says the Lord, but it says thus says me. Okay, right at you. And uh, that, was the, that was their typical job. Uh, a lot of times we think of prophets as somebody who's telling the future, and there was some of that, but it was probably this much of their job that was this big. Most of the time, they were speaking the truth, the hard truth, to people who needed to hear it. And most often, these prophets of the Old Testament came to the king or the queen, and they would bring a word from the Lord, and most of the time, it was a pretty harsh word. Um, But just to say it, it was well-deserved, that harsh word. And we are working with this guy named Elijah, one of the greatest of all of the Old Testament prophets, He prophesied roughly, oh, let's say about 850 B.C. So this is 850 years before Jesus comes on the scene, is born in Bethlehem. And he is coming to speak specifically to in a time where there was a king named Ahab. And you may not know Ahab, but I'm, many of you may have heard the word, the name Jezebel. Queen Jezebel, one of the worst of the worst. They were quite a team, those two, Ahab and Jezebel. And one of the things that they did is they were, Jezebel came from a completely pagan background, and she had convinced her husband that they should have nothing to do with the one true God and that they should be worshiping a God called Baal, B-A-A-L. And these were just heinous worship practices. I won't even go into details of what that all involved, but it was all about manipulating the gods. If you, if you worshiped right, if you made the right sacrifices, then God would send the rain. Now, we've been praying for rain, right? Well, they went 12 steps further, and they did all sorts of things to try to convince the gods that they were worthy as people to receive rain, and that was just one part of all of that. And so Jezebel and Ahab were kings over the northern kingdom of Israel. And 
Elijah was, was to come out and say, thus says the Lord. And when he did that, now how many of you really love to be corrected when you're wrong? Especially, especially when you're convinced that you're right. Well, you can tell, I, I, a professor one time, he said, now you can pray to be a lot of things. You can pray for the gift and power work of the Holy Spirit. You can say, God, I'm willing to do anything. The one job you kind of hoped God wouldn't give you was that of a prophet. Because I'll tell you, they, they were beaten up, thrown into prison, asked to do all sorts of crazy things to convince the people that, that it indeed was thus says the Lord. And so there's Elijah. And he brings a word of great judgment to Jezebel and to Ahab. And they, to say the least, do not respond well. In fact, they can't stand it. And Jezebel, well, we're going to see what happens here. But even this great man, Elijah, who is considered, as I mentioned, one of the absolute greatest of all the prophets, he misunderstands God. He not only misunderstands, he misinterprets God. And he completely underestimates God and what God is up to. Libby, I am so sorry I wasn't more entertaining oh. <laughs> or engaging for you. Oh. But so Elijah, I mean, to give you an idea of how big Elijah is, when Jesus, 850 years later, when, pe- when Jesus asked the question of his disciples, who do people say that I am? One of the first things they say, well, some say you're the prophet Elijah, come back. And in fact, when Jesus is on the cross, they said, let's see if Elijah comes and takes him down. I mean, it was, he was that big and important to the people of Israel. But even him, even he doesn't quite understand the depth, breadth, and the beauty of what God's up to. It's not unlike John the Baptist 850 years later. And John the Baptist, a man so filled with the Holy Spirit that while he's in his mother Elizabeth's womb, at about six months inside the womb, Mary, the mother of Jesus, walks in and she's newly pregnant. John the Baptist, that's not his name yet, leaps in his mother's womb because he's filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, that's a man full of the Holy Spirit, right? And you can imagine Elizabeth's surprise in the midst of that. John the Baptist, he is out there in the wilderness preaching. And as Jesus walks up, he's the one that points to Jesus and says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Is this man in the know? And yet this man... Right after Jesus comes out of the wilderness after being tempted, John the Baptist is arrested by the king. And he's in prison. And he's watching what Jesus is doing. And and, and you almost, you, you can almost see John going, this is not what I was expecting for the Messiah, the son of the living God. In fact, he tells his disciples, John tells his disciples to to go ask Jesus this one question. Are you the one who's to come or should we expect someone else? Because Jesus was not acting the way that pretty much every Jewish person thought the Messiah should act. He was hanging out with the poor. He was healing, touching lepers. He was casting out demons, but he was on a course so different than anything that John had imagined that he just asked that question. And you think, well, okay, that's John the Baptist. But over the weeks, we've been talking about others who completely underestimated God or or misunderstood what God was up to. And we had a, a bit later, Peter is with Jesus and the other disciples, and I'm, and they are at. Um, uh, at a pagan temple, actually, over, looking over it and seeing all the people going to worship. And Jesus says, who do people say that I am? And some, some said, oh, you're Elijah. Come back from the dead. 
And others said, well, yeah, you're, you're one of the prophets or you're one of these. And who do you say that I am? And Peter, God bless him. Or as we'd say down here, bless his heart. With what's to come. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. Did he get it right? Yes, go Peter. And Jesus said, yes, Peter, you are exactly right. And you know what? The son of man, me, Jesus, we, he is going to be betrayed into the hands of sinful men, put on trial. He's going to be found guilty by them. And he's going to be crucified, die. And three days later, he'll raise, be raised. And you know what? Peter could not get his head around that. And so he pulls Jesus aside and said, and, and the word is rebuke. He rebukes him. And Peter says, Jesus, you can't be serious. That is not the way this is going to work. <laughs> okay, Peter just said this to the son of the living God, who could, Jesus himself, the, the one who, who created the ends of the earth. And you, I mean, that's boldness, right? Eh, how's that going to go when you try to be a prophet to Jesus? <laughs> Thus says the Lord. Oh, okay. How does that work when you say that to God? Well, Jesus pulls Peter back out of that private conversation and says in front of all the disciples, get behind me, Satan, for what you want is not what God wants. Thus, <laughs> he's pointing at him and saying, thus says the Lord, Peter. And he was doing it for the disciples as well. Thus says the Lord. This is how I work. And this is how this is going to happen. But they could not get their head around it. Even at the end. And so Elijah... Elijah had been called to not only preach to Jezebel and to Ahab, but to all the people. In fact, he, he goes out there, and if we went into chapter 18 of 1 Kings, and he goes out and he tells all the people, how long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him, but if Baal is God, follow him. Thus says the Lord, that's what he was doing. And you know what, you know what the writer of Kings says? And I quote, but the people said nothing. How's that going now? The people said nothing. And so um, Elijah, it'd be like he went down and rented the Alamo Dome, okay? And he says, all right, everybody come up on this mountain. And thousands of people came. And he said, I bring all of the prophets of Baal, 450 of them, all the prophets and priests, all of them, bring them, and let's make two altars, and, and we're going to have a showdown. It's going to be a knockdown, drag out, winner take all showdown. And so there's two altars, one to Baal, one to Yahweh, the one true God. Here, we're going to cut up a bowl. You put it on yours, I'll put this on yours, and you start. And they go out, and, the, and Elijah says, whoever's God brings fire down... That's the one true God. And so everybody's watching, thinking, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? And the prophets of Baal, they start dancing around. They start yelling. They start screaming. In fact, they take swords and they start cutting themselves, for heaven's sakes, trying to get. And, and Elijah, the whole time, as hours go on, he starts, he starts taunting them and laughing and saying, oh, okay, well, maybe uh, scream louder. Maybe your God will hear you. And he even says, oh, maybe your God's in the restroom. I mean, it's bad. And guess what happens? Nothing. And it's Elijah, Elijah's turn, and he says, Lord, fire comes down then, consumes the offering. In fact, it burns over the whole area. And the, guess what? The people who all said nothing all like, oh, he is the one true God. And you can imagine Elijah going, all right, we got this. The people are all convinced things are going to go well. <laughs> and he says, gather up all those priests and get rid of them. I won't use the language that they use, but it didn't go well for the prophets. We'll just say that. And they were all gone. 450 of them. And Elijah at that moment thinks, I've got this. This, you know, God is good. And I am so in his plan. And, and from now on, things are going to go great. In fact... We're told that in the power of the Lord, he, he, he gets running. He runs all the way to the capital. 
And he's thinking, finally, Ahab and Jezebel and the whole nation of Israel, they're going to come over to the Lord. This is great. And he gets there and Queen Jezebel says, as surely as I live, you're going to die. And with that, we're told that in that moment, he was afraid. You know, just right before that, as soon as all of the fire had come down, right before he ran to the capital, this is what the people said. When all the people saw this, they fell on their faces and cried, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. They're chanting, they're yelling. They're in the Alamo Dome, up around the mountain, whatever it is. And they're yelling and they're so excited. And you can imagine Elijah, so excited. But in chapter 19, verse three, it says, Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. And he went a day's journey into the wilderness, and he says this, I've had enough, Lord. I'm done. In fact, he leaves his servant behind, which was his way of saying to all of us, I'm resigning from the ministry. That's what he was saying. I'm done. I've had enough. Take my life. I've had it. And he lays down, and he falls asleep. And in the midst of that, an angel comes and touches him and he says, get up and eat. Okay? You think of all the things an angel could say or do and that's what he does. And Elijah looks around and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water and he ate and drank and lay down. And I want to mention to you, you know, you look at this and you think, wow, what, what would you expect God to do for you when you were really disappointed, really downhearted, depressed, anxious, whatever it was? Would you expect God to come over, lay a hand on you and say, here, I cooked something for you. Get up and eat. But you know, this is the kindness of God. This is how God operates. He doesn't treat us like we're just spiritual beings. He knows you. He knows me. And while um, I will say that when I've been in down moments, I've never just all of a sudden had food appear. But I will say that I've seen many times over the years with the body of Christ, when somebody has been sick, when somebody has been down, when somebody has lost a loved one, where so many of you have become the angel of the Lord and said, here, eat. With a touch and a precious word. And many of you have been recipients of that sort of grace and love. But that's the kindness of God. Now, here, obviously, it's a miraculous moment But I believe that that is the kind of miraculous moments we're also invited into to participate in and to be those people who do exactly that. With the uh, Meals on Wheels, 